the fire service doesn't operate like what you see on Chicago Fire and, <laughs> and shows like that. Like it's it's much more professional. I think than what you see on that on those TV types of TV shows. Training is essential. T O P talks. Welcome, Ajax, to another episode of TOA Talks. Today on our episode, I have Aaron here with us. He is the fire chief for Town of Ajax Fire. I am incredibly excited to have you here today, Aaron, so welcome. Thank you, Tessa. So recently, you were appointed as the town's new fire chief. Congratulations. Thank you. Since starting your new position, how has it been, and what's your day-to-day like? Day-to-day is extremely busy. (laughs) I probably have one of the busier calendars in the town. Um, We did our fire master plan back in May of 2021. Mm -hmm. So a lot of our focus over the past number of years has really been implementing a lot of the measures from that plan. So things like our renovation at Fire Station 2 that we have on the go, hiring additional suppression staff. We're looking at hiring additional prevention staff as the community is growing and expanding. So just very busy with all the elements of that and then just keeping up on all the day-to-day stuff that comes up, whether it's emergencies or different events that are occurring. As the fire chief, would you attend any emergencies or what is your role in that scenario? So it depends. It really depends. That's the best way of putting it. Um, Depends on if the deputies are in the office or not. Generally speaking, the fire suppression deputy would go to any major emergency scene. And then if the emergency was expanding to the point of requiring to activate the EOC room, your emergency operations center, then at that time, I would take on that role with the emergency operations center, probably overseeing operations. That would be my role. But depending on you know if the deputies are in the office or not in the office, I might end up going there. We split our on call uh, one third of the year. So one third of the year in the evenings and weekends, I'm on call. So in those instances, I would respond first. Ah, oh, okay. I didn't realize the fire chief would be on call, but that makes 100% sense. Um, So with that, you kind of touched on it a little bit. Ajax Fire provides a lot of services to our community, more so than just going out and fighting a fire. Um, With that, what would you say are two to three highlights over the past year that you would consider great accomplishments for your department? Great accomplishments has been, uh, especially in the training division, we've added over 20 staff to fire suppression. So being a former training officer myself, I know the impact that a recruit class takes on, on you. And you really would usually have a recruit class of four or five individuals just backfilling from retirements every year or two. So going through and putting over 23 staff over the period of approximately a year, it was a lot for our training division to do. And we're extremely proud of them. And we're extremely proud of the candidates that we have who are now on shift. And then in addition to that, also dealing with all the lead up and then the start of the renovations at Fire Station 2. That's been a huge initiative for us and a huge project that we're projected. It started um, in in late September and it's uh, scheduled to wrap up in April of 2024. And what renovations would be included with that? So Station 2 is our South Hall. It's off of Monarch. and Right by the ACC, right? Yeah, right by the the ACC. Yeah. Um, So... It is our oldest hall. It was built in the early 70s, and it was very, very dated. Um, You know, we're looking at modernizing it, making an all-gender dorm, all-gender washrooms, all that type type of thing is going to come with it. And by remodeling the station, we're also going to change the location of different elements of the station. So it's actually going to enhance our response times as well. So there's some operational benefits that way, but also... Putting in place the all-gender dorm and all-gender washroom, change room, facilities, all that. Back in the 70s, you had a prevalent male workforce. Right. Now, we were you know, very gender diverse, and we need to recognize that and plan for the future appropriately. With that being said, with it being the South um, Fire Hall, is it still open during the renovations, or how is that working? Yeah, it's still open. We have one crew running out of there. The secondary crew that's going to go down there in April is currently running out of Station 1 just during the renovations. So the crew is um, half being housed with the station and half being housed actually in trailers. So we have uh, a large mobile trailer that the one crew is basically living out of during the renovations. And then we have a secondary trailer that's sort of their meeting room and, and lounge as well. And then they have access to the apparatus floor where the trucks are and some of the workout equipment and things like that. So we've done our best to make it as livable and as comfortable as we can for the one crew that's down there during the renos. And, you know, it's been, we've had our challenges here and there, but I think it's going really well. 
Yeah, that's great to hear. Um, so moving along from the fire hall, are there any common misconceptions that you wish our listeners would know about the work um, that Ajax Fire provides to the community or sorry, misconceptions that could be corrected? The fire service doesn't operate like what you see on Chicago Fire and, <laughs> and shows like that. Like it's it's much more professional, I think, than what you see on that on those TV types of TV shows. Training is essential in the fire service. And it's uh, the Ontario Fire Marshal's office has put in professionalization and certification requirements that are coming out for July of 2026 and also more uh, specialized certifications for 2028. So we're heading towards that. So there's lots of training ongoing. There's lots of certification processes. So even like when I talked about our recruit classes, in the past, we would just train them on how to use our equipment and how to do things the Ajax way. Right. Now we're having to actually train and certify these individuals in public education and, you know, core elements like that. And now we're going to be moving into training them in more specialized rescues, you know, whether it's auto extrication, you know, rope rescue, water rescue, ice rescue. These are all different elements that you have to train and certify people to. So the professionalization of the service is definitely moving up a lot over the next couple of years. And would that kind of training be mandated by the province, by the federal government? Who is kind of in charge of that? So it's it's a bit intermixed. So uh, at the federal level, there were changes a number of years ago that required more standardization across the provinces so that if you're a firefighter in one province, you could be transferable to be a firefighter in another province. So with that came the adoption of what's called the NFPA standards. So this certification process is being driven with that. So you have to certify to the NFPA standards. And that's not just with the fire suppression firefighters, that's what dispatchers, that's with fire prevention staff, that's with training staff. It's all across the board. Even myself, I've had to go through the certification for the higher level fire officer levels. Right. And I assume um, even at the fire chief level, the deputy fire chief level, that you're also constantly going to different trainings and um, kind of keeping up with all the current trends, all the current certifications. I assume there's no point that that stops for a fire in, um professional? No, it, it's it's really, it's ongoing at all times. Um, during COVID was interesting because we had to plan for every single eventuality, right. where as at the time during COVID, I was the deputy, we actually had to retrain our senior officers and mm. bring us back up to speed in case we had to even go down to the trucks because we really didn't know how far of an impact COVID was going to have on our staffing and our ability to staff the apparatus. So we right. had discussions with our union who were excellent through the whole process and agreed, look, if we get to a point where we really need staff, we may need to pull off of even senior officers, which wow. before that was unheard of. Right. I, that's something I never even considered during the COVID period, but makes complete sense. Um, on that same line of thought then, how has the training changed since you first started um, to now? It's changed drastically. So in when I started, which was oh, way back when, we're talking, you know, 2000, 2001, um, when we would hire staff, we had volunteers back then or part-time firefighters. So they would do weekly training with the part-time firefighters and, you know, every other weekend here and there. But we were really geared towards sending people towards the fire college. And instead of NFPA standards, we had volunteer modules for fire suppression and things like that. And similar with fire prevention, you went to the fire college to go do all your training. Right. Well, the fire college during COVID actually shut down. Mm. So there, there's regional fire uh, centers, basically Whippy's one, but you can also host a lot of your courses internally. So right. we're moving more to a model where we're doing all these NFPA courses and certification courses internally and where we don't have the expertise in it, maybe some of the prevention courses, we're having to send people away to do those courses. So there are some more expenses with that because the fire college was heavily subsidized. You could take a course for approximately $65 for a week, and that included your lodging expenses, wow. your meals, your course fees. So there has been some, I would say, downloading in a way from, from the province, but it does provide an opportunity for the municipalities to upstaff with your training division and gear the training towards the services that you actually deliver. So there are some benefits as well to it. Right. And it sounds like it's a little bit more flexible as well that way too. Yes. Yes, it is. We're, we are working with the province to make some of the course offerings more flexible because, you know, when it comes to scheduling and the challenges you have with, you know, 24-hour shifts and, you know, you have four different platoons over the course of a week, it can be hard to run a course because you're having to pull people off of shift, bring them in on days. So we are looking at different models of reaching uh, those individuals for training. Oh, very cool. 
So with that, you mentioned COVID-19. In your time working with Ajax Fire, what have been a couple of challenges that you faced as a department? And how do you usually overcome those challenges? I've gone now through, I, I lived through the SARS oh, yeah. uh, when, when that came through. And it's always, the initial challenge is always the unknown, right? right? You, during SARS, we geared up to wearing our full bunker gear and face masks and all, all that stuff. And then as the the, uh, the issue went on, we realized we didn't need all of our bunker gear. We could go down to gowns and right. gloves and masks and, and that type of thing. It's in the beginning stages, it's the unknown, much like when we had with COVID. Nobody knew how it was going to impact us. Nobody even knew whether your personal protective equipment um, was going to be successful in preventing the better right. transmission. So th those were challenges that we had and having to reassure staff that, you know, we're doing everything that we can to protect them. And then also and what we learned during COVID is the procurement of equipment became, especially personal protective equipment, masks, gloves, things like that. Yeah, the supply so, chain. You know, that became very, very challenging. And, you know, coming out of that, we've really worked to maintain our stock levels. So, you know, if for the next thing that comes up, we're, we're well prepared, we're well ready to go. And we, we did very, fairly well through that. There were places that really struggled and we were fortunate to be more, as prepared as we were. Right. No, and that's great to hear, knock on wood, yeah. that we're ready, but we hopefully we don't need it. <laughs> Can you share with us one of your favorite good news stories that has happened? Good news stories. So looking back to a prevention story where, you know, we had a, a young child who was taught about fire safety and smoke alarms and things like that. And he heard his neighbor's smoke alarm going off. Mm -hmm. And he was actually able to tell his parents, hey, you need to do something about it. And that actually saved a life. So there's wow. lots of good news stories about that. And our crews are out there in the schools. They're instructing fire safety. Um, we have lots of different public events where we're, you know, teaching fire safety to seniors and we're all over the place trying to get the messages out about checking your smoke alarms monthly, you know, replace the batteries when you need to. Don't disconnect your smoke alarms. It, it truly is very effective. And, you know, replace your smoke alarms every 10 years. These are all things that people need to recognize and, and do. And when they do those things, then you, you enhance safety for everyone at the end of the day. I remember I was um, lucky enough last year to be able to um, attend with Ajax Fire and Sparky, um, the fire chief for the day competition. And it was actually amazing to see how excited the kids were to see the fire truck pull up to the school, see the firefighters get out, see Sparky. And they were so encouraging to the full girl who won. Um, and then during it, I was uh, chatting a little bit with some of the um, firefighters and um, talking about the importance of going to schools and, you know, starting this at the elementary level. And one thing they had mentioned to me that I had never even considered was providing the messages to school age children is also providing the messages to parents as well as a reminder. Um, you know, they go home and you ask like, hey, how was school today? And they're, you know, ready to tell you all the cool things they learned about um, fire prevention, fire education, and it gives those little reminders to the parents as well. And I thought that was really interesting and something I didn't think of before. So yeah, the school opportunities I find to be really exciting. And um, is the fire chief for a day? Is that an annual competition? Yes, it is. It yeah. is. And it's geared right around fire safety. So mm -hmm. a lot of times they're having to draw home a skate plan of what they would do in the event of a fire in their house. And that that same thing, like we were just saying, that takes it home to the parents to see. And it creates those conversations, which are good with the parents, where they go, oh, no, we actually need to address this. You right. know, we, we should be talking about this. We should be doing that. And that's what we want to do is try and prevent the fires before they happen. And if they do happen, make sure everybody's prepared right. on what to do. So this is a, it's a great initiative. It gets so many kids involved throughout the community. And it's something that we definitely want to continue doing every year. If there's one safety tip that you can provide to our listeners right now, what would it be? And why might this be so important, important as a reminder? So number one, test your smoke alarms monthly. Make sure they're working. Make sure you're changing your batteries when they're required. You have some that require regular 9-volt batteries, some that are 10-year batteries that last for the life of the smoke alarm. Make sure you're checking to make sure that they're working because they will save your life in the event of a fire in your house. Make sure you change your smoke alarms every 10 years. That's important because you want to make sure that they're not out of date and that they are functioning properly. And if you do have to change a smoke alarm in your house, it's important that you're changing it with the same 
type of smoke alarm. And what I mean is if you have a battery detector that's already there, replace it with a battery detector. If you have a hardwired smoke alarm, make sure you're replacing with a hardwired smoke alarm. If your smoke alarm's interconnected with the rest of the smoke alarms in your house, change it with one that's already, that's interconnected as well. You have to maintain that same level of service and it can vary based on when your house was built and the codes. So with that, are you able to upgrade um, from a battery operated one ever if you did renovations? Oh, 100%. Yeah. Um, okay. my, my own house, I my house was built in the 70s, but I have Bluetooth interconnected 10-year smoke alarms. Oh, cool. And I have over 10 of them. They're pretty much in every room. So What does the Bluetooth do? It interconnects them to each other. So okay. So it pairs them together. So if one smoke alarm goes off, they all go off. Right. Oh, okay. And... You know, maybe this isn't here yet. Maybe this technology is coming. But is there an opportunity to connect Bluetooth to a phone? So let's say if you were at work and uh, your smoke alarm is going off at home, would you get an alert on your phone? Yeah, a lot of the the different security companies have gone down that road where you get the alerts right in your phone. Mm -hmm. And it, that's exactly what it does. Whether it's carbon monoxide or smoke alarms, you can get the alerts right in your phone. Oh, amazing. That's That's actually really cool. Yeah. And we're kind of getting a little bit to the end here of our episode. What is your favorite part about working with your team at Ajax Fire and the Ajax community? Overall, when I'm talking about my team, it's the professionalism of my team. You know, there you have great individuals who have a broad spectrum of experiences, life experiences, work experiences that they bring to the table. And we face unique challenges every day, whether it's inspectors or our frontline suppression staff that are out there that you can never plan for what your day is going to bring. And, you know, they always say that firefighters are jack of all trades, master of one, which is firefighting. <laughs> but at the end of the day, we're, we're called to such unique challenges and you have to be able to think on your feet and think on the fly and come up with solutions to these, these problems that people face. And it's, I'm so proud of the work that our people do day in and day out. And, you know, that's with our staff and, and with the department, the way we're, engaging with the public, the, the, the effect that we're having when it comes to fire safety of getting out there, whether it's our Get Real Ajax program, the public fire safety messages that come around the holiday season, all that stuff. We're out in the public. We're engaging with the public. We're really preaching the messages of fire safety, and that's really important to me. Do you know when the Get Real Ajax campaign normally runs and when people can expect to see that information? Yeah, it's usually in the spring and fall okay. that, that it is running. It runs usually twice a year. And, and what's involved with that? Um, what kind of outreach does the fire department do? It's usually a door-to-door -door campaign where they go through the subdivisions and they have a conversation with the residents to make sure that they're doing a lot of those things I've been preaching about checking their smoke alarms right. and just general fire safety messaging. And if they want us to come in, we'll come in and look around and give them some tips as well. All right. Oh, that's that's amazing. I didn't know you went door to door like that. So that's actually really cool to know. And um, to finish off here, what is the best way for listeners to reach out to anything that pertains to your department? They can contact the department directly. They can contact us through um, the best way is probably through the town's website. Yep. All of our contact information's on there. And, you know, if they have an issue, feel free to reach out. We're there to help. Perfect. And uh, with that note for listeners, um, Ajax Fire does have a dedicated space on the Ajax website. So if you type into your browser, ajax.ca slash fire, that will bring you directly to anything um, regarding, um, let's say, prevention, education, upcoming events that the fire department's doing, anything fire related, all their contact information is there as well. And our fire department is also active on Twitter. Uh, they're a little bit of a newer account. It came out during COVID. And, um, or sorry, I should say X, not Twitter. And you can follow them at Ajax underscore fire. Well, thank you so much, Aaron, for coming in today. Uh, this was a really interesting conversation to have. I actually learned a lot of things that I didn't know about the fire department and I'm a town employee. So it was very beneficial to me. And I hope our community also finds this very educational and um, an interesting conversation to listen into. Yeah, thank you. No problem. Anytime. I'm Devin Jarvis with the Town of Ajax TOA Talks podcast. Episodes can be found on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, YouTube, and on our webpage at ajax.ca slash TOA Talks. Listeners can download and listen to each episode offline or online from their personal device. If you have comments or feedback about our show, you can email corporate at ajax.ca. Thank you for listening, and we'll talk later, Ajax.